introduce Sister Nancy Keough, um, RSCJ. She graduated um, with the class of 59, Dushan College. And she still has uh, several friends in the Omaha area. And she is a wonderful mental health specialist and um, professional. And she's going to talk today about several different things, but um, we will save questions until the end. It'll be uh, probably a 30 to 35 minute talk with room for questions. Um, and I believe what happens is you type your questions in and I will choose, if, if they come flowing in, I'll choose which ones I can as they come in. And um, then I'll pop back on and ask you those questions, Nancy. Great. Does that sound good? That's perfect. All right. Well, we're excited to have you. Let's get started. Okay. All right. Well, as Megan said, I too wish I were in Omaha with you all, <clears throat> having celebrated Alumni Reunion Weekend in person. I have one correction to make for the record. I was a freshman at Duchenne College in 1955, but then entered religious life in the fall of 1956. Actually, 64 years ago yesterday, I arrived at Kenwood to begin this very long journey. In the summers from 1960 to 65, I attended summer school and only graduated from Duchenne in 1965. However, I always considered the class of 1959 my class, despite what my diploma says. In beginning our reflection tonight, I would like to begin with two poems and a prayer of Philippine Duchenne, all of which invite us to focus on this time in our lives. The first is a poem by Heifetz, a beloved 14th century Persian poet, and it's entitled For a While. We have all come to the right place. We all sit in God's classroom. Now, the only thing left for us to do, my dear, is to stop throwing spitballs for a while. The prayer of Philippine, which she said often, was this. I am where God wills me to be, and so I have found rest and security. God's wisdom governs me. God's power defends me. God's mercy encompasses me. God's joy sustains me and all will go well with me. And the second poem is by a young woman named Alondra Bobabadilla, who at the age of 17 in January of this year was named the youngest Boston Poet Laureate. When she was named Boston's Poet Laureate, she anticipated festivities, speaking engagements, book signings, and a closet full of new clothes, as any 17-year-old might. But then her mother contracted COVID. She had to stay home to take care of her and was quarantined. And so for the next four months and continuing, she could go nowhere. But in that process, she wrote this following poem. I think of this as a golden moment, an opportunity to let the soul inside you speak buried truths, an opportunity to extend yourself beyond your limit, to pick up old instruments from which you once found purpose, a chance to mend wounds that have been left unattended, to bring light to places that have for so long been abandoned. It is not often life is forced to a halt, forced to slow down on command. It's not often the noise is called to a whisper and the bustle reined in. Stay home, they say, stay safe, stay in and be. God's classroom, where God wills me to be, a golden moment. For our reflection tonight, I would like to focus on the idea of being in the right place, 
God's classroom, where God wills me to be, a golden moment. And to consider the necessity of paying attention to all of who we are, our bodies, minds, and spirits. God's classroom, the classroom that we find ourselves in at this moment, who else is in the room? Who are we as students? What are we bringing to the class? This classroom has no walls. It is global, connected in myriad ways, and there are over 7 billion students. None in this classroom by choice. None here because they heard there was a great professor who was going to teach some life lessons. It is a strange classroom because almost everyone is masked and it isn't even Halloween or some Viennese ball. We are all in the right place. Are we? It doesn't feel right to anyone. Everyone feels out of place in this classroom. This is not what anyone had in mind when they heard the term learning environment. Look around at the others in the classroom. People who may have their own airplanes and therefore are not bound by travel restrictions. Poor mothers in a migrant camp. Adolescents who wanted to be visiting colleges but instead are locked down in their basement trying to fake, stay focused on one lesson while also trying to absorb another one. Black women trying to balance the need to get back to work and learning how to navigate distance learning for their 10 year old who wants to be trying out for Little League. The woman sweeping the streets in India. The child in Africa with his mask on carrying water home to his village on the top of his head. The children in all of our network schools throughout the country. The farmer who is bereft of his income. The firefighters in California. All students in this classroom. We can't know what others in the classroom are bringing or how they see themselves there or if they even think of anything beyond surviving, not interested at all in what might be learned. We might wonder, but we really only know how we are in this moment and if we can learn something in God's classroom. For months now, we have heard the words unprecedented, unique, challenging, extraordinary, and these used over and over again. Unlike many other countries in the world, we have not known war on our soil, countrywide famine, dictatorships that meant people living in constant fear and extreme poverty. We have had droughts, floods, fires, hurricanes, but these have been limited to certain parts of the country. Not since the flu epidemic of 1918 or the depression of 1929 have we experienced something that has infected the entire country. 9-11 was an attack on our country, but did it, it did not affect us all in the same immediate way. We can consider all this because what has probably been an unconscious expectation that most of us have lived with these months and years and years is all goes well for us. All will go well for us. Except, of course, if you are black or undocumented or live in the tenements below the poverty level and don't have medical insurance. But in the experience of such normalcy that most of us have had, we have perhaps not developed our resiliency, our courage, our sense of community, 
and the need to see how our own way of being affects others. So we bring to this moment a kind of complacency, an expectation of how we think life should be, and that is being challenged. Perhaps one of the lessons in this class is that we are all deeply connected, that what I do, something as simple as wearing a mask or not, can have repercussions on others. That God is not just my God, but our God, our Father. On a more individual level, we bring all of whom we have been up to this point, our culture, our ethnicity, our geographical location, our family of origin, our physical makeup, our mental health status, our education, our faith formation, our past hurts and joys and triumphs and failures. Each of us dwells in our own unique house, filled with all of our history and experiences. Everything that has made us who we are to this point and shapes how we respond to this moment. Think of that. What are you aware of that is being brought to consciousness at this time in helpful ways or in unsettling ways? No matter what our history, the mental health of each person in God's classroom at this present time is being affected because we are all living with stress and stress takes its toll on us our bodies, minds, and spirits. Stress is a response to a threat in a given situation. It is a demand placed on our brains and on our physical bodies. It can come from multiple competing demands, some of which we have control over and some of which we don't. But simple things like going to buy groceries, what time of day is best? Do I wear a mask? Do I bring my child with me? Will school reopen? If so, how? Will we have to return to distance learning? What do I do about an upcoming family wedding? My parents live alone, but they have significant health needs. And then there is the racial conflict and the political divisions that often mean we can't talk freely to friends or family members. So even simple things have changed. Not everyone feels safe in this classroom as we might have a year ago. Stress and anxiety are not the same. While we all are feeling stressed, individuals will experience anxiety in different ways. Anxiety comes from within. It is our reaction to stress, and it is associated with feelings of fear, worry, unease, and impending doom. Because it comes from within, from the way we interpret the situation, we have some choice about how we think about the situation. Viktor Frankl, in Man's Search for Meaning, written after he got out of the concentration camp, said the Nazis could do whatever they wanted to to his body, but they could not get to his soul. He was the master of his soul. But in those conditions, that took heroic effort to hold on to. I think for us today, it is sometimes hard to really believe that I can have some control over the way I think and feel about the situation. I would like to offer a few examples of what I mean by our response to the situation. A person who grew up in a dysfunctional family in which there was early trauma will have different reactions to the current situation than a person who grew up in a fairly stable family situation. For the first, perhaps the memory of not being in control, of being terrified, 
of feeling unsafe all makes these days, weeks, and months extremely anxiety provoking. A person may be experiencing post traumatic stress. But another person who also grew up in a dysfunctional family may have a different response a sense of resiliency, of courage, of strength, a sense that I have gotten through hard times and I can get through this one. For the person who has grown up in a stable situation, these times may be deeply unsettling because they have not known uncertainty. Their psychological and spiritual muscles have not been stretched. They have not had to work hard just to cope. For them, the familiar sense of everything being basically okay is not there, and they may feel very lost. Same external reality, but varied ways of thinking about it. I encourage you to think of your life lived up to this point. What from the past is helping you or causing you more stress and affecting the way you approach our current reality? For individuals who have lived with mental illness prior to COVID, these days are certainly even more difficult. Chronic depression, anxiety, panic attacks, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, paranoia, just to, make, just to name some of the stress serious mental illnesses can all be exacerbated by the current crisis. Added to that is the problem of isolation, of the lack of work, of involvement, it is so important these days to be faithful to taking medication, to staying in touch with mental health professionals, with friends, with family, and getting out when you can. For our mental health these days, whether we have suffered with some chronic mental illness or are experiencing situational depression, anxiety, or panic attacks, we know that to be good students, to be able to learn from and not be destroyed by our current reality, we have to take care of ourselves, get adequate rest, eat well, exercise, play, share with others, whether that be our time, our talents, or financial resources. To be good students, we need to pay attention to the teacher. Two passages from the prophet Isaiah are particularly relevant. The first is from Isaiah chapter 30, verses 20 to 22. And scripture says, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore. But your eyes shall see your teacher and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. And further on in Isaiah we hear, all your sons and daughters shall be taught by the Lord. What this means is that we have to learn to be still that we have to listen to the still small voice within us and to trust it. Later, I'll say a little bit more about stillness and listening. We have considered being in God's classroom, that at this moment we bring all of who we are and have been in our lives. And now we can consider God, Jesus, as teacher. The apostles often referred to Jesus as Rebbe, Rabbi, Teacher. I love this quote from Catherine Patricia Cross. And she says, the task of the excellent teacher is to stimulate apparently ordinary people to unusual effort. The tough problem is not in identifying winners, 
but in making winners out of ordinary people. God, Jesus the Spirit, is an excellent teacher, but we often rail against the instruction, which by the way is always individualized instruction. Working with each one of us where we are and drawing us to what we can become. In our current classroom, each one of us is being called out of ourselves to something better. All of us who have taught know what makes for a good student, one who is open, curious, not closed-minded, attentive, reflective, able and willing to communicate and to make mistakes. Obstacles to learning are mental mindsets that are fixed, emotions like anger or resentment that we have to be taking this class, and those get in the way of our freedom to learn. To learn these days, we need to let go of our expectations, a sense of how things should be, and try to be open to what is. Every teacher, every classroom, every student needs resources, materials to draw on. Jesus used everything around him, nature, biblical stories, silence, prayer, interactions with people, attention to the marginalized. What are the resources that we can draw on in this classroom? Do we believe we are in God's classroom? That like Philippine, we are where God wills us to be. I actually have a hard time with that concept of God willing me to be here. What I more struggle with is to believe, to have faith that God is here with me in this time. I do often feel like the apostles when they were in the boat with Jesus on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a raging storm, and they cried out, don't you care that we are sinking? To believe that God is with us. In the Sacred Heart schools these days, we have what is called the goals and criteria. And these goals and criteria are the guidelines by which schools in the Sacred Heart Network attest to their fidelity to being a school of the Sacred Heart. And the first goal says, schools of the Sacred Heart commit themselves to educate to a personal and active faith in God. To educate to a personal faith meaning that it is something we each need to learn. Just as we learn math, science, how to analyze literature, how to write, how to do art, faith doesn't just come to us. The ability to believe in something bigger than ourselves is something that we have to work at. We have to work at it. And how do we do that? Just as we focus on other disciplines, we need to give it time. Faith is about a relationship with God, and so we need to focus on that relationship. Focusing on the relationship is what we commonly refer to as prayer. But I sometimes think when we use the word prayer, it suggests a thing we do, like I have to make dinner, I have to exercise. I have to make sure my children are getting their assignments done. I have to visit my mother. I have to respond to the emails. I have to learn a new online teaching tool. I have to do some volunteer work. I have to do another Zoom. We do not think of prayer as a connection we make. In other words, someone I have to talk to, someone I need to be with some reality bigger than myself that I have to pay attention to. With our consciousness of the internet now and how we are using it these days, we can think of faith in relation to this, that God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, love, energy is there all the time. 
that it is in God that we live and move and have our being. That we are in God's classroom, but we have to believe to get online. The power of the internet is there all the time, but we have to plug into it. Just as our computers need to be connected. Non-believers are just that. They don't believe there is anything other. But for believers, we do. So prayer starts with that connection. I believe that you, however I name you, are there. And I want to be in relationship to you, especially now. I want to learn from you, especially when the way is unknown, especially when I am feeling weak, frightened, and not in control. Just as in any relationship, there are different ways of being with people. But the first step is setting aside time to get to know them. With Jesus, God, the Spirit, we can't see them, touch them, or hear them. The root of the word spirituality is ruah, breath that which is of life. So what brings us life, energy, love? Something that is the other with a capital O. But we can lose sight of that over time. Just as Jesus found God everywhere, it is sometimes useful to think of when we have had an experience of the other. We have probably had several in the course of our lives. Think in your own life. Can you recall a time or many times when you were struck by something truly awesome? It may have been something of beauty, something so tremendous that you were silenced in its presence. It may have been the birth of your child, or it may have been an experience of being loved and forgiven, or someone's act of generosity hearing a word from a sacred text that you knew in your gut to be true. In living, we have all had moments when we know experientially and intimately that there is something greater than ourselves. Those are the times when we feel most alive. When we focus on them, remember them, and use them as jumping off points to deepen our belief, the sense that not just of transcendence, but imminence, that we are in God's classroom all the time, and that we have been touched by God, by Jesus, the Spirit, and we have learned something. Going over these moments is like reviewing our lessons. And one of the things about the Jewish people that I love is that they so often go back to remember Remember when God saved us from the Egyptians. Remember when God saved us from the Red Sea. Remember when we were fed manna in the desert. And I think we can each do have kind of that memory litany in our own lives. I think this is also an exercise we can do with our children these days. To take some time each day, or grandchildren, to take some time each day to be quiet with them to ask them to think of something in the day that brought them joy, that nourished them, that gave them a new way of seeing that they were grateful for. These days we can be so caught up in all the demands and stresses of the world of COVID that we can lose touch with the deeper part of ourselves and our children can lose touch with that too. As Catholics, we say the Apostles' Creed, but let's stop at the first line. I believe in God, Father, Mother, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. To say I believe in you, God, Creator, the believing goes beyond what we can know, and yet it is rooted in what we can know. The awesomeness of creation, the courage we see around us these days, the generosity of people, the, our prayers these days that men and women will be able to create the treatments needed to cure the virus, to test for the virus, 
God is at work in all these men and women. God, creator, spirit, energy. And we believe in Jesus Christ, that we have a God who wasn't just going to exist with a lot of social distance, but a God who was willing to be embodied. In other words, to take on flesh, to know what it is like to be one of us, to suffer the loss of his friends, to experience rejection and misunderstanding, to be betrayed, to eat with and enjoy friends, to love children, and to disappoint his mother. Believing in God, in Jesus, in the Spirit, doesn't mean that all will go well for us. As we see from the prophets of the Old Testament, from Jesus' life, from Madeline Sophie's life, or Philippines, or Martin Luther King, or Gandhi, or the millions of Jews who suffered in the Holocaust. Faith does not protect us from suffering. It offers us a way to be with it, to live through it, without the pain making us angry, bitter, selfish people. Suffering either makes us better or bitter. And that is where we have the choice. That is where we can draw on the spirit. The other greater than ourselves, but we have to maintain that connection. We have to spend time daily in the presence of the other, believing that when we quiet down, take time, ask the spirit, Jesus, whatever name we use for God, that we will not be left alone. David Brooks, the Washington Post columnist, in a magnificent sermon given in DC on July 5th this year to an empty Episcopal cathedral said, and I quote, faith is weird. Faith doesn't make any sense. Faith is the hope in something unseen. It takes something truly remarkable, truly counterintuitive, truly beautiful to inspire a leap of faith. Events have got to push somebody so hard that only faith can explain the unexplainable. And of course, faith is not just a decision you make one day. It is a decision you make every day. As Frederick Buchner put it, you've got to wake up every morning and say, can I believe all that all over again? And if you can do it three days out of 10, you know what faith means. Faith itself is not serene. Faith itself is a storm. It is the beauty you taste amid the storms of life. And again in goal one we read, they open themselves to the transforming power of the Spirit of God, to the teacher. Members of the school community engage in personal and communal prayer, reflection and action. So just as your daughters have assignments in each subject, I would like to suggest that you take the assignment of your faith education to heart and carve out some time every day to focus on your relationship with God in whatever way that helps you. And here are just a couple of suggestions. The first is just talking to God, Jesus or the Spirit, telling God what is on your heart. If you are afraid, if you are angry at what you are losing because of this crisis, if you are worried about your family, your children, grandchildren, and their futures, or friends who might be losing their jobs, or how the school year would be played out, whatever is on your heart, bring all of who you are to God. The second way is doing some reading of scripture of sacred texts, of people whose challenging lives were shaped by their faith. Recently, I have read Sister Phil Kilroy, she's an RSCJ, who wrote the definitive book on St. Madeline Sophie. And I was amazed at the suffering in Sophie's life. And yet her absolute conviction that Jesus was with her 
and would see her through all the seemingly insurmountable issues she faced. Conflicts within the society, with the hierarchy, her own illnesses, the TB, cholera, and malaria epidemics in Europe and in America, and the ongoing political upheaval. The third way is to pay attention to beauty, to God's creativity, listening to music, journaling about what you believe or don't, and asking for help, reading poetry, something that nourishes your soul, but connect daily. So all of this can be done not just individually or as a couple, but as a family. We are faced with an invisible reality over which we have no control. We can and must take all the precautions necessary to stay safe, but this virus seems to have a mind of its own. Just as it is invisible, we must believe that there is also an invisible power greater than the virus that is at work in all of this. That we are in God's classroom and we are being invited into a new way of thinking about what it means to be a global community, what it means to care for the earth, what it means to reach out and touch someone, not physically, but with our minds and hearts. No place on earth is exempt from this current crisis. So is God calling us to truly think of the whole human race and make the world better for all of us? Can we listen to what God's call is in this and use the silence at a, to hear at a deeper level to become students once again? Perhaps the most important aspect of this time, as the poet Alejandro said, is to be still, to take the time to be still. As the psalmist says, be still and know that I am God. Being still is not something that most of us are comfortable with or accustomed to. Even sheltering in place or being locked down, we can fill our worlds with noise. We can have our earplugs in listening to music, podcasts, books on tape, anything to keep us from engaging with stillness with silence, with the opportunity to do what Alejandro said. I think of this as a golden moment to let the soul inside you speak buried truths. How can we help our children listen to their own voices, pay attention to the world around them, find creative ways of connecting, gain a better sense of what it means to have limits? We are spirit, mind, and body, so we need to attend to all of who we are. Self-care is critical at a time like this. Pope Francis, in an interview with a man from the magazine America said, and this is the Pope Francis, take care of yourselves for a future that will come. Take care of the now for the sake of tomorrow. Always creatively, with a simple creativity, try to invent something new each day. Don't run away. Don't take refuge in escapism, which in this time is of no use to you. Contemplate the natural world. Reconnect with our real surroundings. This coming from the only leader in the world who is actually concerned about the whole world who carries all who suffer in his heart. And he is calling for each of us to look again at our common home in his encyclical Laudato Si. If spirit is ruah or breath, are we to learn something from the fact that this virus attacks the lungs, our source of breath? What can we hear in this stillness? But what I'd like to do now is to take whatever questions or reflections that you have. And then just before we end, I want to 
Um, I want to end with a um, short poem from Hopkins and a, some lines from the song. So. Thank you so much. That was absolutely beautiful. That was gorgeous. And I think that would speak to anyone right now and any age right now. And the two things I thought about were um, new way of thinking. The new way of thinking. I, I don't think I would have ever thought to do a Zoom <laughs> right <laughs> webinar <laughs> with one of our RSCJ. Why didn't I do that in 2019? Right. <laughs> I mean, um, and the new way of thinking has connected our global community. We are so lucky to be a part of the network of mm -hmm. uh, Sacred Heart Schools. And I hope all of the parents listening tonight um, understand how much we adore your, your girls and um, we are here for them every step of the way. Um, one question that came in from Claire Donahoe, it, um, she says, how would you advise people to accept the things that are out of their control in regard to the pandemic? Thank you for doing this tonight. God bless you. Claire Donahoe, class of 2019. How would you expect, I, I don't think I caught all the words in that question. How would you advise people to accept the things out of their control with regard to the pandemic? Okay. Um, well, the thing about accepting what's out of your control, if it's, if it's not in your control, then you can either just get angry about the fact that it's not in your control and be resentful and use up your energy that way. Or you can say, this is not in my control and try to let go. I think that connects with what I was saying earlier, which is for different people, not being in control has different stressors. So, for one person, it may be about safety. For another person, it may be about um, well, security or knowing that they're right, you know. So I think it's useful to try to understand what not being in, what about not being in control is so threatening. And so if you can't, <coughs> excuse me, um, Bless you. Thank you. I, every time I sneeze, I think, no, I'm not getting COVID. <laughs> um, um, so I, you know, I think that, you know, in AA, they have, the, I mean, the whole premise of AA is turning one's life over to God as we understand God. And it's really hard to come up against how much we don't have control over and not to let that define us as a person. I'm not a bad person because there are things I can't control. I'm just a human being. And that's why there are things I can't control. I mean, I can't control storms. We're certainly not controlling the fires in, in California and Oregon and Washington. So I think part of it is really looking at ourselves and asking, what about this makes it so hard for me? And can I change my view of it? You know, in other words, that if I can't control this, it doesn't mean I'm not a smart person. It doesn't mean I'm not a strong person. It just means that there are some things that are beyond me. So I think that's the invitation is to look at what does that mean for me? And it's going to mean different things for different people. I mean, I, I can let go of a lot of things, but there are other things that I find it very hard to let go of, you know, and, and feel like, well, if I just did this, it would make a difference. If I did that, it would make a difference. And then I have to say, no, it's not going to make a difference. But it's, it's an ongoing struggle. And I do think we need the Holy Spirit to help us. That's great. Thank you. Um, I have a few comments um, from Mary Warren, class of 97. She was in my class. She says, thank you for acknowledging the impact of trauma on our responses to stress. Mary is a social worker and she lives in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say that is really so true. I mean, I think people who have had any kind of trauma, I mean, I, I think of people, 
you know, who went through Katrina, people who have gone through the hurricanes, people who have gone through personal family trauma, these days are much more challenging because it triggers off all those early experiences. And, uh, and that's why I think being really patient with ourselves and gentle with ourselves is so critical because one thing triggers off the other. Right. And uh, control may have something to do with that too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Meg Brudney, our head of school, do you find all of your hope through your faith? I am normally an optimist, but I find myself working hard, working to find hope in the midst of COVID fires, racial disparity. It can be challenging. How are you keeping hopeful? Oh, Meg, that's something I'm struggling with too. It, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, I think, you know, that when I, I think the two things that have actually helped me most recently are reading this book of St. Madeline Sophie and seeing it in ways that I had not really known because this book is so thorough. What she went through was unbelievable. And yet she just kept at it. She kept believing that Jesus was there with her and that God would not let her down. And through many dark days. So that's one thing. And I've also just been reading uh, the Churchill book, The Splendid and the Vile and his courage. So looking at what other people have gone through and how they've gone through it has been a help. Um, I also read poetry at breakfast. And the other day I was feeling kind of discouraged about everything that's going on. And I read this wonderful poem by Mary Oliver about evidence and just her highlighting ways in nature that she found evidence for God in those kinds of things help me. Um, it also helps me to try to live one day at a time. I think that's, that's the name of the game right now. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Eileen Fitzgerald McKinstra, she was class of 89. She says, I'm listening to the, I'm listening even as I type. What comes to my mind is that there are opportunities for adoration hours at my parish, St. Joan of Arc. I've been considering signing up one hour each week, but hesitate because my life does seem so busy. There are always excuses, reasons not to spend time in prayer, but I know that those times in adoration, when I have taken even a little time to pray, I'm always glad I've given my time that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I think those are the kinds of things that, you know, um, there's a payoff down the road. We don't necessarily always feel that if I spend that one hour when I walk out of the chapel, I feel differently, but I think it's the consistency of doing something like that, that over time you begin to see, wow, yeah, I'm different, or I'm, I'm less anxious, or I can reach out and be generous. Or, so I think it's that, you know, it's the consistency, it's the showing up that can make a difference. Well, even just having you said, you know, say, I was reading poetry over breakfast, you know, so many of us have the news on and have yeah. our phones out and have, you know, that is something so simple mm -hmm. that can be done in a 10 minute period. Doesn't need to be an hour, doesn't need to be. And so I think that that's a great little, I mean, if you can do snippets of that, mm -hmm. a lot of us are busy with kids and work and schedules, but that small little bit could be a huge help. Mm -hmm. um, an anonymous attendee, um, is said, how, how would you talk to someone about considering therapy or counseling as an option? Oh, I definitely, I mean, I've spent 23 years as a psychotherapist. Um, I, I'm glad that person raised the question because I didn't, one, one um, I, I don't feel I spent enough time maybe on the mental health issue tonight. Maybe we could have another Zoom. <laughs> um, but I think when, what we're going through feels really unmanageable. It is the time to reach out for help. We, we definitely do not need to suffer alone. And because everybody is, everybody is struggling, we, we sometimes hesitate to call friends because they're, they also may be having a 
you know, a stressful, bad hair day. So I think that professionals, that's what professionals are there for. And if they're good professionals, they also know how to take care of themselves. So I definitely, when, when someone is just feeling like they're, they have all the signs of, you know, depression in terms of sleeplessness or uh, too much sleep, not enough sleep, overeating, suicidal thoughts, um, inability to find pleasure in anything, all of those things, it's important to reach out for help. And most therapists that I know are doing Zoom calls and phone calls. And so um, therapists are accessible. And if you, um, I mean, depending on what the person is going through, medication can also help, you know, to deal with anxiety and panic attacks. So anything that feels a little bit beyond the normal range of we're all stressed, we all are, you know, have better days than others in terms of depression, um, I would definitely, definitely recommend reaching out for, for some help. I agree. I think it's great. Um, Jessica Morrison wrote, thank you, Sister Keo. I'm a graduate of Stone Ridge, 1998, and I'm a guidance counselor and campus minister at a Boston area all girls high school, right in your town. Oh, uh, she said this presentation was so valuable for my work in my own faith life. Um, Carrie Meyer, uh, Mary Warren said therapy is such a gift. It is time devoted to you and only you. It's also an unbiased person who can validate your feelings. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie Myers, who is in charge of our prayer partners in Omaha at Duchenne. She's a current mom at Duchenne. Um, the stigma of mental health needs to be normalized, just like going to the dentist. We need people to feel like it's okay to get help and not be ashamed. I agree. Absolutely. In fact, I can say um, that um, in the book that I wrote, which is called Wrestling with Our Inner Angels, Faith, Mental Illness, and the Journey to Wholeness. In the book, I deliberately put in that after my mother's death, I struggled with depression. And I went, um, I got medication. I had, I did therapy. And I say that because I want when people see someone like myself and they can say, well, you're this professional and you do this and that, you know, that I went through a very dark period of time and it was so beneficial to me. So, um, you know, our, our brains are an organ of our body, you know? So just as we have to take insulin if we're diabetic and we have to take um, blood pressure medication, our brains need to pay, be paid attention to also. Mm -hmm. And if we could think about, I don't, don't even like the word mental illness, but, you know, a brain disorder or, you know, that there's something amiss with our brains and we need to pay attention to what will write that. That's why medication works for mm -hmm. a lot of people. And medication with therapy is the ideal. Um, so, you know, it's, that that the stigma of mental illness goes back centuries and we just have to keep working away at it and and watching the words that we use around it you know mm -hmm. um i hate it when i hear someone say i know a mentally ill person i know a person who suffers with mental illness i don't say i know a diabetic person i know a cancerous person mm -hmm. i know a liver disease person so Changing our language, I think, is really very important. Okay. Um, Christine um, Beeler, and she is asking, thank, or she says, thank you so much for a great session. What was the name of the Madeline Sophie book again? Uh, it's called, um, I think it's called Her Life. The, the Life, St. Madeline Sophie, A Life. So No, it's called Sophie Bear a life. I think uh, the the name is Phil Kilroy. K I L R O Y. Okay. I think it's called Sophie a life. Okay. But it's a great. It, it's not a great book in the sense of a great read, but it's fascinating in terms of the history. That's great. I haven't read that one. 
It's about uh, 400 pages, so it's, it's an investment. <laughs> I have a few, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. There are, is there, are there any more questions or comments? Um, oh, thank you. Claire Donahoe sent the uh, link, the Amazon link to the book. So it's Great. right here in the um, comments here on the chat. Great. Um, let me see really quick quickly about my Q&A. Thank you for an inspiring talk. Your book is available at Omaha Public Library and I just reserved it <laughs> from an anonymous. Um, are there any more questions for Sister Keo? I think we're getting lots of nice chats. I'm looking in my Q&A and I don't see anyone, but we appreciate your time. I know that it's I'm going to end with a, I'd like to end with uh, this uh, poem and a psalm and um, the, it's it's just the second half of a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins called God's God's grandeur. Okay. And for all this nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. And we can close with these lines from the psalm. Though we are beset with many fears that cause illness and troubles, God, the beloved, all-powerful spirit, is ever ready to lighten our heavy hearts, to ease our burdens, to comfort us in our sorrows. The beloved renews the life of all who surrender to a power greater than our hearts. Amen. Amen. I thank you so much for this invitation. I've loved being with you all. I wish I could see you. And hopefully within 12 months, I can be in person in Omaha. <laughs> we would love that. Come home. <laughs> I would. I, I want to come home. Right. Yes. Well, we appreciate you and thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon. Great. All right. Thank you all. Be well. Be safe. Be still. Thank you.